Now, when you look at the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, there's a little table in it which almost everybody has missed, or if they haven't missed it, they've seen it and then scurried away. I mean, Churchill once said that people stumble across the truth from time to time, then scurry away as quickly as possible. And, and, and I think this is what people have done with this little table buried in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report, because it says that in order to have a high chance of two degrees of warming um, and no more than that, we need to stabilise concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, not at 550 parts per million, but at 350 parts per million. And when you consider that we already have 380 parts per million of co carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you realise the scale of the challenge that we face. And this is what brings me to my very unhappy conclusion that small is not beautiful when it comes to dealing with this problem. Because the micro-generation and the low-level, localised solutions which many people have promoted at most could give us a 20 or 30 percent cut. Two papers in particular propose something much, much more ambitious. The first was produced last summer by the German government looking at the scope for cutting carbon by building what it calls a European supergrid. Now, one of the problems that you have with renewable energy, which is absolutely critical to dealing with this issue of getting the carbon dioxide out of the energy system, one of the problems with renewable energy is that if it's all concentrated in a relatively small geographical area, when it fails in one place, it fails everywhere. So, for instance, if you're getting all your wind power from the Scottish Highlands and you get a still day in Scotland, you've got no wind power. But if you're getting some from the Scottish Highlands, some from the North Sea, some from the Irish Sea, some from some other country a very long way away, there's a much higher chance that if the wind drops in one place, it's still blowing in another place. And so you get much more reliability from your total system. If you link up the grids of all the European nations, you don't just get a much wider geographical um, scope as far as your variable renewable power is concerned. You can also tap into some predictable renewable power. For instance, the hydroelectric systems which already exist in Scandinavia and in the Alps, where you know that you open the floodgates, you get a certain amount of power out. You can match it to demand in a way that wind can't be matched to demand because short of getting on our knees and praying, we can't get the wind to blow when, when demand rises at particular times in the day. They go even further, though, and they say, right, let's look at how we can tap into completely reliable, renewable sources even further away than other European countries. And the one in particular they point to is one that I examined in heat, which is this tremendous resource just to the south of Europe called the Sahara Desert. And the great thing about deserts is that the sun shines an awful lot in them. There's very little cloud cover. And, um, and you get uh, an incredibly reliable and concentrated resource of solar radiation. The particularly good thing about the Sahara Desert is that it runs from east to west. And that means that as the sun's going down in one place, it's coming up in another place. And if you were to implant large-scale solar thermal power generating farms across the Sahara, you get about 15 hours of solid electricity production every day. By itself, even if you use just a very small proportion of the land area, you have enough to provide Europe's current electricity demand even before you talk about energy efficiency, which, of course, has to be a major part of the, the, the formula. It goes further and says we can link up with Iceland, with a very long-distance undersea cable, using its geothermal power. Now, stick that study together with a recent one conducted by the Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales, which shows that how, how through a, a system of substituting transport fuels for electricity from renewable sources by having a whole electric car and electric bus network, and by making use of electricity as a primary heat source, driving, think, for instance, heat pumps to produce much of the heating that we'd use in our homes and, and in businesses, even without making use of 
any resources outside of the United Kingdom, except for on our own continental shelf, some way out to sea with wind and wave power, they claim that we could be providing all our energy exclusively from renewable sources. Now, there are some pretty optimistic technical assumptions in their report. One or two are, are, are a little bit wild, to be honest. But there's this profoundly pessimistic assumption that we only use the UK's own resources to do it. And it seems very clear to me that if we stick that report together with the German report and the idea of the European supergrid, even before we contemplate the energy efficiency, which, as I say, has to be a major part of this, we have a formula for the 100% replacement of all energy sources bar one, or, or, or rather, rather all energy uses bar one in the United Kingdom, that one being aviation, for which, unfortunately, there is no good technological substitute and over which the only solution is a massive cutback in the amount of flights we take in the order of 90 to 95%.